My name is Michael Rowland and uh, this right here is Lisa Miller. Again, another round of applause to the author in residence here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And good afternoon and welcome to ABC News Lunch. <laughs> How good would that be, that time <laughs> slot? Yes. So, okay, so we want to move it to Queensland. Oh, can yes. I say that? ABC just to the beach, just over summer, can we move news breakfast? ABC News lunch from Noosa. Yes. It's got okay. a nice ring to it. Sorted. Well, Gavin Morris is the next guest who's coming along, so why don't yep. we just wait and... Hey, and he's leaving. Time. He can make any decision oh, yeah, he wants he and pass it on to the next Could guy or Could he make decisions gal. about our contracts? Yeah, I hope yeah. so. Hey, I want to zigzag uh, a bit uh, and go back now to the Gympie Times, right? where it all started. I, I love this section of the book where you talked about what you did. You got a cadetship there. It was pretty menial stuff, but it, it, you really um, earned your straps there as a journalist. How, how important was the grounding in a, in a regional newspaper for you to get onto Canberra and to get overseas? Oh, I think... Uh a regional newspaper background is one of the greatest gifts that I ever got and it was accidental in a way because I was at university and everyone was going off to do work experience with um, high profile organisations, the Courier Mail, the Telegraph at the time, Channel 7, they were going up to Mount Cutha in Brisbane and I can remember thinking, God, I've got nothing organised. So I went home to Gympie and asked if I could do two weeks work experience there and on the second day, the Irish cadet who was in his late 20s had this furious row with the editor over the fact that the local police officers could not understand his accent and so things were getting mixed up in communication. And the Irish cadet said, I'm not even going to pretend to do an Irish accent, but anyway, he quit and he cleared out to the pub across the road and um, the editor looked at me and said, oh, well, do you want a job? And that's how I ended up getting my first job in the organisation. I told that story at the 100th anniversary of Queensland University's journalism department, which happened in May last year. And someone came up to me afterwards and said, I'm married to that Irish cadet. <laughs> And he is now 63 years old and I can't wait to tell him that because he quit, Lisa Miller got her first job in journalism. But, but He's was, the reason. Yeah, but it was, it was such a great start because you had to do everything. You had to do police rounds yeah. and court rounds and you were confronted with a lot of stuff. I did a what's on column, you know, what's on with Lisa Miller? Get down to the Albert Bowles Club and, you know, hang out with whoever. And it was tried to make it all very exciting. But I think the thing that was very important was that you were very close to the people you were writing for. There was no emailing or texting or phoning. When people wanted letters to the editor printed, well, they wrote them out by hand and then delivered them in person. <laughs> you could hear their footsteps coming up the stairs and you knew that Ron Owens, the gun shop owner, was coming with a letter to the editor. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the days. Now, you uh, worked and worked and worked towards your ultimate ambition, which was to become a foreign correspondent. Uh, and after all the effort, after all the blood, sweat and tears, you finally got the gig, uh, but you got the phone call or letter uh, that uh, you'd been appointed to the US as a correspondent there on the 7th of September, 2001. Yeah. Take us through the days that followed. Well, I mean, you know, that day, I remember everyone celebrated for me. I was working at the ABC in Brisbane and the biggest stories in America had been still the continuing fallout from Monica Lewinsky, even though Bill Clinton was no longer the president. They'd had a, um, B Bill Clinton, they'd had a, a summer of the shark where a bull shark had nibbled on a child's ankle in the water. And so everyone said, oh my God, the sharks are coming to get us. And it was on the cover of Time magazine and that was the big story. And then, of course, I celebrate with some cheap wine in a plastic cup with my ABC colleagues on September the 7th. And on September the 11th, I'm sitting on the couch at home watching the world change as so many people did and realised that the posting was going to be nothing like what I had anticipated. 
I immediately rang the international editor to say, send me, I should be there, I'm the new correspondent. To which she said, who are you, go away. <laughs> I mean, it was, there was no way they were going to send me. I was a, a junior correspondent, I didn't even have a visa, I hadn't done the hostile environment courses, hadn't packed up my house, I mean, there was no way I was gonna go. So I spent three months basically in Australia getting ready for this posting and then arrived in America on December the 1st, 2001, when Ground Zero was still a smoking wreck. I mean, it was still smouldering. And I can remember the pilot on the flight into DC saying, thank you for flying with us. I know you could choose anyone. You could choose not to fly at all. I can't tell you how important it is you are on board this plane with us. And there were still F-16 circling over Washington, D.C. 24 hours a day because they were so concerned that uh, there was going to be another attack. And you and I worked... Um, we didn't work together in Washington. We kept sort of being tag teams because I was there from the end of 2001 to 2005 and then I went back again in 2009. But there was... It, when I was writing the book, it was extraordinary to think about... The, the, what the lengths we went to and the fear factor that existed. I remember our office manager telling us that there could be a dirty bomb exploding at the White House and we had to cover the windows with plastic tarp to try and protect ourselves. But then he was a bit of a tight ass and he found out the tarp was too expensive. So he said, don't worry about it. That's that was Grady. That was Grady, yes, one of a kind. Uh, you mentioned flying, which is a great segue into uh, one of the great themes of the book. Uh, it is, of course, called Daring to Fly. Uh, you had for many, many years this absolute terror, which I think is the best way of describing it, of hopping onto a plane, no matter how big or small. Firstly, take us through what, what triggered that. Uh, I mean, I, I, my, my hair was raised reading your experience in, in, in chronicling that in the book and how you managed to overcome it, given you've done, what, a gazillion flights over the years. And it's, there's, there still must be a small part of your brain that goes in the fight or flight, flight or no. fight mode. Really, no. not now. And that is, the, that is what I think the miracle of it, that I went from someone who had a fear of flying that was so severe that on one particular flight, I could not form my body into the seat. I couldn't make my knees bend and I ended up lying on the floor of the plane because I was so filled with fear. If you had said to me, hey Lisa, we've got to take news breakfast on the road, we're in a Boeing 737 in three days, I would have started being physically sick at the thought of it. I still would have made the trip because that's what I did. Mm. I had to show up. I had to do it. I mean, I, you know, I never once thought maybe I can't do it. It happened because as a young reporter in North Queensland, I was in a six-seater doing a quick trip down to central Queensland and we got caught in a... Um, bad thunderstorm and the pilot was trying to dodge the storm cells and he ran out of fuel in the main tank so he switched it to the reserve tank but there was an airlock and the propeller stalled and I just remember that sensation of the plane dropping and the propeller spluttering and that fear you know it didn't start sort of building into something for some time after, but gee, when it built, wow, it was. Un and you know, if anyone tells me they've got a fear of any sort, I will never minimise it because I feel like I went to a, a huge extreme. But you know, it I, it built up for a almost a decade until my then husband and I were on a trip to Tassie and we'd gone to the wedding of. Pip Courtney and John Bean, which some of you some of you might know them, and um, it was a beautiful wedding in Tasmania. And I spent the whole time checking Spirit of Tasmania departure times because I didn't want to get on the plane to fly back to Queensland. I wanted to get the boat and then drive from Melbourne to Queensland because I was so scared about getting on the plane home. Mm. And my then husband said, "We can't live like this." And so I did a fear of flying course, and it was the start of my recovery. It took about two years, but I recovered to the point where I now just look at planes in the sky when 
you see them rarely and think, I cannot wait to get back into a plane. I never have a moment of fear. Oh, wow. Give me turbulence. I am fine with it. I am cool. My fear of flying only happens if I don't jag the exit row. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they call you Platinum Michael. Then, yeah, so I, I wish, I wish. Um, Let's go back overseas, uh, all these flights you've made to and from America, through America and of course through the UK. Uh, you were overseas for the best part of the last 20 years, right? Is there one story, one experience that stands out most for you in, in either a good or bad way? There were lots of good times, lots of fun times. I mean, I spent 12 years in total as a foreign correspondent for the ABC and I think it is an incredible, incredible privilege. I see Rachel Brown in the audience. I remember the night of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee concert celebration outside Buckingham Palace watching um, Paul McCartney perform and thinking, pinch me. (laughs) Overrated. Pinch me, pinch me. But it is hard hard to move past the stories that have had those huge impacts on you, which tend to be the tragic and the the difficult to deal with. And even though I covered almost a dozen terrorist attacks in my time in Europe, it was probably the Sandy Hook school shooting when 20 children were shot dead on you know, shortly after they had been dropped off by their parents that affected me the most. Um, We got to Sandy Hook on that Friday night. It happened on a Friday morning and Sandy Hook in Connecticut, we we flew in and we drove. There was, you know, a metre of snow everywhere. It was so cold. Um, But I'll never forget that night and I'll never forget the parents that I met and, and the connection that I made with them over the years and have maintained, which has meant a lot to me. Mm. It's such a a tragic story. And, you know, I've always spent some time over in the States. Gun, uh, their gun uh, system, gun law system is so crazy as an Australian. And I I thought if there was one tragedy, one tragedy that would change gun laws, bring in any scintilla of tightening, it was the killing of these five and six-year-olds. Yeah. And it didn't happen. But this is what, when when the next shooting happened, you know, well, there were so many. You did Virginia Tech. You covered Virginia Tech. And in Florida, when the university students... Um, were killed and they were marching on Washington and everyone said, this is it, this is going to be the one that changes everything. And I said, if 20 dead children don't yeah, change it, never will. what's going to change it? You talk about covering terror attacks and you chronicle this so uh, well in such a raw way in the book about 2017, which was your Anna Cerebellus mm. as a correspondent. How many terror attacks? Oh, I don't know. I lost count. I keep I keep writing. I think there were nine. Yeah, it was the London Bridge. It was Westminster. It was Manchester. You know, there'd been the Paris attacks. There'd been the Nice attacks. It was. We got to a point where, and and even today, I thought I, I should just remind myself of some of these things because it does start to just sort of you lose track of it all, and um. You know, the Manchester Arena attack, I just got back from a few days leave when it happened that night, you know, and it's just this sense during that period of it just being one thing after another. And it did wear me down. You know, I don't want to give it all away for those who haven't read the book, but it did lead me down a very dark path and also um, gave me a lot more education about what a cumulative trauma can do to you as a journalist, which I think we, a lot of us, have taken for granted. How important is that, without getting into the, the finer details of the book, how important did you personally, or have personally found trauma counselling and how important is it for journalists who don't necessarily need to be foreign correspondents, they've been covering bushfires, seeing some awful stuff, suburban car crashes, how important is looking after yourself as a journalist yeah, these days? No, I think it's absolutely critical and I feel like the peer support system that we have at the ABC uh, is very important, looking out for each other, very important. We've put a lot of things in place. Um, Kate McMahon is here from the Dart Centre for Journalism and Trauma. I first met her in 2006 after I went to Singapore and covered the hanging of Van Nguyen, um, a young Melbourne man who'd um, 
um, been convicted of drug smuggling and I'm so grateful for that relationship and for the education that I had over the years. Um, and when people ask me how I feel about getting up at 3am in the morning and working with you, Michael, I say... So how lucky are you, Lisa? Yeah, <laughs> it's a walk in the park. Even his puns, I can deal with it. <laughs> You talk about trauma just then, but what about the adrenaline and the real highs and how do you modulate that, that adrenaline rush and then back to, you know, doing the dishes and washing the clothes and that kind of stuff? Oh, I didn't do the dishes. <laughs> no, I did do the dishes. Sometimes I wished I had a wife who, you know, could help out with that kind of thing, being, you know, very un-PC. But um, it was... Um, you boxed things up when you were working. I mean, there was certainly adrenaline. Like, I loved being a journalist. If you had said to me, hey, in 2017, you were going to have one of the toughest times ever and you're going to lose your dear friend and mentor, Mark Colvin, to cancer and, you know, your dad is going to die and your relationship is going to break down, then I would say, well, I'll do it all again because, you know, one of the things that... I feel like all of that has made me who I am today. So, yes, there is a lot of adrenaline, um, but, and it, it is a roller coaster, uh, but that's also part of the gig, and that's why you sign up for it. And, you know, it was time to come home when I came home at the end of 2018. Um, I'd had some incredible moments. It was one of the things I want to say, a lot of people have made a fuss about that photo of me being super excited at Harry and Meghan's wedding. And, and it was really odd because at the time there were a few people who were very critical. Oh, surprise, surprise, you know, on social media saying, oh, you know, such a Republican and why are you, you know, making a fuss about Harry? And I thought, I, they don't get what we've been through, what the UK had been through over the previous couple of years with Brexit and with the terror attacks. And it was just this reason to celebrate and to have joy. And I think that is also what most people have got out of the book as well. It is about the joy that I have been able to find through those years. You've covered all these momentous uh, occasions, be they royal weddings or horrible terrorist attacks. It is a challenge though, especially for the good news stories, to sit back and take some time to appreciate it. I, one, of, one of my great personal and professional highlights was that I was lucky enough, privileged enough to be in Grant Park, Chicago on the night that Barack Obama became president-elect in November 2008. And I, as you would have been, just so slammed by radio news deadlines, current affairs, TV, all of that. I just had to put down my microphone and savour the moment and I'm so grateful that I did because it was such an historic occasion. Did you find yourself in similar situations? I found it very hard to, you know, step off the sausage machine and take it all in. Were you in a similar situation on those stories? I am embarrassed at the moments in history that I have missed. And that example just rams home to me that in 2004, when a young senator from Illinois stood up at the Democratic Convention in Boston and he delivered this speech that had everyone going that is the next president of the US. I was out the back doing a live cross for the midday news and I missed it all. And people to this day still talk about that speech and I missed it. And, you know, there were absolutely moments that you have missed. I remember the night of 2008 when Obama was elected. I was in America just for a short period of time. I was in the office while you were in Chicago. I'd been flown over. Um, I was there with Dart, but uh, I was helping out the ABC and everyone was rushing down to the White House, all of DC just celebrating because Obama had become president. And I was in the office filing radio news stories. And I wish that I had said to them in Sydney, I got to go. You're going to miss three hours of radio news, but trust me, it's going to be worth it because I'm going to go down to the White House. I did, as I progressed through my career, get ready to actually say, be stronger in that regard. And I remember being outside Downing Street after the Brexit vote and being 
you know, a few metres from the door of number 10 and we'd all been called there and David Cameron was walking out to resign after holding this disastrous election that he thought was going to support his bid to have had, you know, a Brexit referendum. And I remember saying to my producer, Emily, just stop for a moment because we are watching history happen. And I only wish that I had had more moments where I had stopped and absorbed the history and not rushed through it, doing our job. You mentioned citizen journalism um, and remote working and we're all sort of being able to meet with people all across the globe from our lounge rooms. Do you see a future where, maybe not the ABC, but across the spectrum where instead of having someone posted in New York, you just cut through to CNN's person or you cut through to New York Times person and just broadly more um, looking at the sector? Yeah, no, look, I don't think anything can take away from having an Australian eye on a, a foreign country, and I would hate that to disappear. Uh, it's a dilemma that we're going through at the moment, really, when we are contemplating our planning for the death of a very significant 95-year-old, uh, whether that occurs and we take... Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Are you in those plans? I'm not. Um, and of course, you know, when the beetle disappears, that's going to be another thing altogether. I'm not turning up for a week. I know you're going to wear black. But it's, you know, do we just run BBC coverage or do we give Australia an Australian eye on it. So I don't envisage a day where we won't have foreign correspondents. I think that is still absolutely critical. Um, Yes, it is hard because it is expensive. And, you know, I'm eternally grateful that the ABC has stuck with it. It has changed in that we will now have more journalists out there who are video journalists who are filming their own work, but we still have those Australians on the ground. Great question. Uh, just please raise your hands. We've got time for a few more. Yes, Matthew. Oh, thank you. Lisa. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> sorry. But I said, uh oh, because Matthew Rickardson has been a friend uh, with the Dart Centre for Journalism What's bad about and Trauma that? <laughs> for some time. And he read my book and he sent me an email and he said, hmm, and he had questions. And I said, oh, well, feel free to ask them at the press club. And I wished I hadn't said that. <laughs> I'm only asking a question because you told me to ask a question. <laughs> but, Justin, I can tell you that you should start reading tonight. It is a terrific book. I really did enjoy it. And I thought I'd conveyed that, but anyway. Um, <laughs> you did. I, I'm interested in, uh, you, you, you've mentioned in the question and answer session with Michael, you've mentioned Guantanamo Bay, you've mentioned the, obviously when you began as a, as a foreign correspondent on you know, September 2001. Those are now 20 years ago. And I'm just interested in your reflections, having covered those events and many others, what do you think journalism can do and what do you think it can't do or struggles to do? Oh, that's a really hard question. I told you I'd ask you one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that as... I think that journalism... I think it would have been great to be able to have as a journalist more time for the context, to develop the context. As Michael and I were sort of saying about that almost missing history sometimes because you're doing the 2pm radio news story, the 3pm radio news story. And as a journalist, and when I read the beautiful long features on the New York Times website, and I think that is the kind of piece that I think journalism does and does well. Uh, there is a woman who called Carol Rosenberg, who was a journalist at the New York Times. She used to be at the Miami Herald. She has spent the most amount of time on Guantanamo Bay. And I always read her material because, sorry, because she um, has that context that so many of us have not been able to have. What does journalism not do well? Well, well, lots, quite frankly. You know, if we, had, if we had more funding and staff and all the rest of it, then we could do so much more. Lisa, just because, you know, my job is teaching young journalists and we're at the time of year when um, students are deciding what they're going to do for the future. I know you've had a fabulous career. It's been amazing and you're someone that, you know, we talk about in class and someone that, you know, they want to be but would you still encourage someone to do journalism 
next year, start an undergraduate degree? What, can, what kind of hope can you put out there? If they are passionate about it. You need to be really passionate. And that hasn't changed. I would have given that advice 30 years ago. And it's been a roller coaster for me. I was made redundant when the newspaper shut down. You know, I, I couldn't get a job initially and ended up at the Gympie Times, which I remember, you know, some of my colleagues at university sort of looked down on because it was a, a regional newspaper. It hasn't all been, you know, beers and Skittles. I would say to a journalism student now, if you are absolutely passionate about this, and if you're not doing it just to get your mug on telly, if you are genuinely curious about the world around you, if you walk out of a room like this and wonder, what are those police doing on the street? I want, I want to find out what's going on. If you want to know and you feel that and it's deep inside you, then I would say, yes, you can be a journalist because I think that we are seeing a new kind of journalism. It's not what Michael and I grew up doing, but that's okay. It's, it's a different kind of journalism and we haven't yet seen what it is going to be in five, ten years' time. I'm, I'm kind of excited. You know, there are things that are happening. It's the, you know, maybe it's the Google money, maybe it's Facebook finally realising that it needs to pay for the news it puts online. You know, there, there will be some good times ahead, I am convinced. So uh, I would just say if you are genuinely curious, if you are genuinely passionate, then go for it and persevere and don't worry about the knockbacks. We're all going to get knockbacks. Get up and just try, try again.